Good evening and um, welcome to our <coughs> talk tonight. Um, I'm Peter Jameson and I am the chairman of the Friends of Czech Heritage. For those who are not familiar with us, um, we, the Friends of Czech Heritage is a UK charity and we were founded in 2007 and we are dedicated to the conservation of Czech historic artefacts and in particular buildings. We give enabling grants to help conservation projects to get underway and we also run volunteer working parties. The Friends of Czech Heritage was um, uh, founded in 2007, we're a UK charity and we are dedicated to two things. One is uh, the conservation of historic buildings and artefacts and the other is that we run working parties. Um, and we give grants, enabling grants, to help little projects get underway. Um, and naturally, at the moment, our, uh, all our activities are curtailed. Although our conservation projects are proceeding, we may yet again have to uh, postpone some of our working parties. However, thanks to Zoom, we have started uh, to hold some of our events, which is, this is one of them. And we have further events in April and May and a couple of outings planned for July and details of those will be on our website. Finally, uh, may I mention money, um, a thorny problem. Um, we are naturally are always looking for um, some help and the, our talks have all been so far, this is our second one, have been free um, and but nevertheless if you felt able to give a small contribution um, to our dwindling funds um, that would be very helpful and our details are on our website which you can find quite easily. And now to our talk. Um, to most of you uh, Barbara Peacock will need no introduction. Barbara is an art and architectural historian and was one of the co-founders of the Friends of Czech Heritage with Ian Kennaway. Since graduating from St Andrews University, she has pursued a career as a lecturer and organised numerous courses and related visits both here and abroad. Her particular interest is the development of the Great House and its gardens. She has had a long association with the Czech Republic going back to the period following the Velvet Revolution, which in those days was a, a sort of voyage of discovery. She tells the story of visiting the great chateau of Uhuchitsa, which she will mention in her talk, I've no doubt. At that time, a near abandoned hulk and unable to gain entry, she stood on the bonnet of her car, looking over the wall and all she could hear was a dog crying in the depths of the building and nothing else. No human appeared at all. And since then, Barbara has led numerous tours there and written and lectured profusely about the wealth of great buildings that lie in the Czech Republic. And her enthusiasm for her subject is undimmed. Uh, for her promotion of the Czech heritage, she has received the prestigious Lifetime Award given by Czech Tourism and the Points of Light Award from our former Prime Minister, Theresa May. So tonight, Barbara will talk to us about the great houses of Bohemia and Moravia. And now I hand you over to Barbara, if you'd like to start the talk, Barbara. Thank you very much. I began by saying or reminding you how in September 1938, as Hitler was poised to march into what was then Czechoslovakia, Neville Chamberlain pronounced those apocryphal words, why are we digging ditches and putting on gas masks for a people in a faraway country about whom we know nothing? And as you know, following the Munich Agreement, Hitler invaded and eventually occupied the entire country. And after the war, Czechoslovakia was hidden behind the Iron Curtain and most of us had little idea of the richness of the Czech architectural heritage. Following the Velvet Revolution, thousands have poured into Prague 
But com even now, comparatively few venture out into the countryside beyond and explore the amazing diversity of castles, country houses and gardens that survive in Bohemia and Moravia. Because of the position of the country right in the heart of Europe, the Czech lands are a crucible of culture uh, with influencing influences coming, coming in from the countries around Austria, parts of Germany uh, and the northern part of Italy, uh, where artists and architects flooded into the Czech lands. And even in the 19th century from England. Today, we tend to think of the Czech lands as, an, as a, a, a rather small country, but in the medieval period, the, the country was one of the wealthiest in Europe, with lands at one point that stretched right north, as you can see on this map, right up to Brandenburg, and uh, incorporating Silesia down here, uh, part of Lusatia over here, which is the area between Germany and Poland. And then in the 17th century, the situation changed. Bohemia and Moravia were no longer an independent country, but was swallowed up to become part of a huge Habsburg empire. And here on the left-hand plan, you can see the border of the Austro-Hungarian em em empire, um, so of which Bohemia and Moravia were just one small part of this huge uh, agglomeration. And from then on, really, there was a massive building program. Many of the wealthy nobility had their winter palaces in Prague and Vienna, and their summer seats and hunting lodges uh, in Bohemia and Moravia. And the result is that the Czech lands, in the Czech lands, we have one of the largest concentrations of great houses in Europe. What you see on the right hand screen is just a small section of um, South Bohemia showing you this huge concentration. Uh, so it means that today the visitor can see an astoundingly rich artistic legacy. Um, <clears throat> it has been estimated that over 12,600 castles and chateaux and ruined fortresses survive in the Czech lands. And it means today that one can see all periods ranging from medieval fortresses to Renaissance chateau, from Baroque palaces to romantic Gothic castles. And considering the country's troubled history, it's amazing that so much survives. And in addition, there are innumerable fine churches, important gardens, and unspoilt little towns like Telch that you see on the bottom right, that so far have been saved from the ravages of commercialization. Today, although there's some industry in the north, the countryside remains remarkably rural and unspoiled. It is a land of deep forests and rich pastures, a landscape that of course inspired the music of Dvořák, Janáček and Svetna. Old ruined churches are a picturesque feature and ruined castles and great chateaux are a constant feature of the landscape. Going back to the medieval period and starting there, this was a time of great castle building. And the greatest of medieval kings was, of course, Charles IV, who became King of Bohemia in 1346 and Holy Roman Emperor in 1355. And whilst England and France were being torn apart by the Hundred Years' War, Bohemia experienced peace and prosperity. Charles made Prague the capital of the Holy Roman Empire and the political, economic and cultural centre of Europe. Uh, Prague became the Rome of the North and <clears throat> a, a city which he endowed with magnificent buildings. He built the famous Charles Bridge, which you can see in the screen, St Vitus Cathedral on the hill and founded Charles University, the first university in Central Europe. But possibly Charles's most famous building is the great castle that he built in deeply forested country uh, to the southwest of Prague, Karlstein. 
Karstein was built uh, primarily as a safe place to house the because Charles had a passion for relics, and like many of his contemporaries, he believed in their supernatural power. So wherever he went, uh, he was on the lookout for relics, and he was given presents of them. The Byzantine emperor, for example, gave him the supposed bones of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Hungarian king, a fragment of the <clears throat> tablecloth used at the Last Supper. The French Dauphin, gave him two thorns from Christ's crown of thorns, and so on. And these very special and holy relics were to be kept in the chapel of the highest and tallest and strongest building in the castle, the great tower or keep, which you can see prominently on the picture. This tower or keep has walls up to six meters thick. It was like a fortress within the castle. And the chapel at the very top was guarded by four doors with 19 locks. And this is the chapel of the Holy Rood or Holy Cross, which is one of the most wonderful medieval interiors in Europe. The lower part of the walls are encrusted with <clears throat> uh, semi-precious stones set in gilded plaster. And above the, 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 the walls are 128 panels of prophets, apostles, martyrs and knights and kings representing the company of heaven. Uh, these are by one of the greatest painters, bohemian painters of the period, Master Theodoric. The, then the ceiling of the, ch of the chapel, the vault, is covered with gilded discs of Venetian glass in the form of sun, moon and stars. And originally, what you must imagine is the light from over a thousand candles reflected from the special from the precious stones and glass di glass discs, which would have created an effect of unimaginable luminosity, a sort of image of the heavenly Jerusalem on Earth. Master Theodoric's great painting of Saint Luke, which you see on the right, is a thought to be a portrait of Charles himself. And the next slide, this slide will just give you a, a, another view of the semi-precious stones um, in the lower part of the walls. And the uh, relics were kept behind panels and the imperial coronation regalia was kept in a niche below the altar. The recent restoration of the chapel after long, long years of, 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 of neglect is one of the great success stories of recent years. Now, in the <clears throat> later periods, the castle fell into a ba bad state, into semi-ruinous. And so in the late 19th century, a great scheme of rebuilding and restoration took place, as you see in the bottom slide. So there's comparatively little left of the 14th century, other than the chapels in this great keep. But what does survive is this remarkable 14th century great gate through which Charles himself would have written. And this gate, uh, which you see on the right, is something that the Friends contributed to restore uh, relatively recently. <clears throat> now, one of the best preserved late medieval castles to survive, which wasn't rebuilt in the 19th century, is Pernstein in Moravia. Uh, with its jagged silhouette rising above the deeply forested slopes that surround it, it's really the archetypical fairy tale castle. It was originally owned by the Pernsteins, one of the most important and, and powerful families in the Czech lands. And the castle was founded in the 13th century on a very narrow rocky plateau so that one couldn't build outwards if one wanted to expand, one had to build upwards. And that's why in the 15th century, when more accommodation was needed, a series of little projecting rooms was, was, was built out, which, same, which gives the castle its picturesque silhouette that we have today. 
Inside, a new hall was built, which has this very characteristic, what we call cellular vaulting. It's very beautiful vaulting, which becomes a feature of uh, many me late medieval Czech interiors in both domestic buildings like townhouses, as well as in larger secular buildings like uh, castles. Well, coming on now to the 16th century, A new period opens in Czech, Czech history and architecture because this, in 1526, Ferdinand I of Habsburg was elected as King of Bohemia. Now, Ferdinand was at the same time Archduke of Austria and King of Hungary. And this succession of Ferdinand is very important because it actually marks the beginnings of the Habsburg consolidation of power because in 1556, Ferdinand was also crowned Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. So it meant that the Habsburgs now ruled over this vast empire, which you could see on the map, which included Bohemia, Moravia, Silesia, parts of Austria, part of Germany, Hungary, and, northern, and parts of Northern Italy, and eventually uh, right down to Croatia. So the Czech lands lost the independence which they'd enjoyed in the Middle Ages and became just part of this huge empire, which was eventually ruled from Vienna. Uh, <clears throat> now, Ferdinand was a great lover of the Renaissance. And in 1532, he built one of the very earliest Renaissance buildings in the Royal Gardens of Prague Castle. It was a little summer palace or belvedere for his queen. And here you have this early introduction um, of, uh, of, of early Renaissance arches, such as you had in some of the early Florentine buildings by Brunelleschi of 50 years before. Uh, the Belvedere was actually uh, created by Italian architects coming mainly from the northern areas of Italy, the areas around the Italian lakes. And it was now really that huge numbers of Italian stonemasons, artists and stuccadors poured into the Czech lands, establishing themselves in Prague and all over the country, really bringing the Renaissance into the Czech lands. And at the same time, many of the nobility uh, went to Italy and came back inspired by all that they had seen there. So throughout the 16th century, there was a massive amount of rebuilding as castles were updated and new palaces built in the Renaissance style. And great Italianate arcaded courts like you see here at Apochno became very uh, fashionable. Uh, although of course they were actually totally impractical for the Czech climate because the winters there are very long, spring doesn't, winters can go on to April. So these open arcaded courts intended for Italy were really not suitable for a much uh, more northern climate. And in fact, very often many of them were later glazed in. But here is a lovely one uh, that uh, survives. They were particularly fashionable in Moravia. Um, now, often we find Italian influences uh, from Renaissance Italy mingle with the influences from northern lands uh, like Flanders. And we see this clearly in Littermichel, another great Renaissance house built by, another, <coughs> built by one of the most powerful of uh, Bohemian families, again, the Pernsteins, whom we mentioned before. Now, if you look at this building, you've got a classical Renaissance loggia up here, but at the same time, you've got these very elaborate gables, an idea which came in from the north, these fantastical gables from um, the Low Countries. And as well, you've got the use of what we call scraffito. Scraffito decoration is created by incising into the plaster and creating either whole scenes or patterns. So here you've got the pattern of rusticated masonry, making it look as if the building is built of stone and therefore more expensive material. But as well, you can also get decorative details as we have here. 
Um, Scrofito was uh, an idea that came from Italy, but it was intensely uh, taken up in the Czech lands, and you find it not just on, on uh, palace buildings, but also delightfully on many town houses. Little Michel has a great Italianate arcaded court, but at one end of the court you have an entire scene, an entire wall created in this uh, scraffito technique of a battle scene. And very often the scenes would be from classical mythology, Bible stories, or just uh, decorative elements from, from the world of nature. Sometimes Renaissance houses are moated, and here is a delightful example at a house called Craftivile in Bohemia. It was built as a hunting lodge for another very important patron, Wilhelm of Rosenberg. The Rosenbergs were another very powerful family in Renaissance times. So it's set on an island surrounded by a moat, then surrounded by gardens, and all these little pavilions where you could go and have have uh, drinks and admire the garden. Now this building um, was used as a museum of the cartoon for many, many years uh, in communist times. So these lovely rooms were just filled with rather boring cases. But just very recently, it's been uh, there's been a complete restoration plan. None of the original furniture survived, but furniture of the period has been brought in to create the uh, atmosphere and the feeling of a Renaissance noble household. This house has wonderful uh, plaster decoration, stucco work carried out by Italian artists. Generally, the themes are themes taken from classical mythology, showing uh, stories of virtue, storing, uh, stories of heroism, but as well there are delightful painted scenes. So it's a wonderful uh, Renaissance ensemble, both inside and out. But one of the most famous late Renaissance houses is this one, Butchewitza, uh, built for Jan Jernohorsky, who was Lord High Steward to the Emperor Rudolf II and a great patron of art. Uh, here we have one of the most lovely of Renaissance courts with this beautiful late Renaissance fountain. And inside we have an amazing series of Renaissance rooms. The reason that these rooms survive is because later on the um, the chateau became part of the Liechtenstein, uh, the economic centre of the Liechtenstein estates. So they, it was just used uh, for the officials, really, and the interiors were never updated. So we have some a sequence of extraordinary rooms. Uh, here is the astonishing room of the hares, where hares. Uh, uh, act out the life of courtly aristocracy. So here we're having hares indulging in a banquet. But very often uh, in the scenes around the, the main uh, central, central painting are scenes where the, the humans are being satirized, being turned upside down, being um, jumped up and down in, in, a, in a sort of blanket. And this sort of satirical um, presentation of an inverted world it was very popular at the Renaissance. So uh, here that unusual room and then the grandest room of all was this imperial room filled with uh, its magnificent stucco and painted decoration. Now the theme of this room is partly anti-Turk because at this time the Turks had captured half of Hungary and were a constant threat. And so on one wall, we see the Emperor Charles V mounted on horseback with a Turk fallen beneath him. You can just see the Turk's turban. Um, on another wall, we have Mars, the God of War. And the craftsmanship of these figures is superb. They're partly of wood. Uh, the wood is then covered with stucco and the decorations include pieces of colored glass set in gilded stucco to imitate precious stones. 
then around the room are uh, busts of Roman emperors, like Augustus, whom we have on the top right here. He represents the golden age of the Roman Empire. And the point really was to reinforce the idea that the present is a golden age. The whole of this room was a sort of tribute to Charles, uh, the, uh, Charles V, the emperor. And just below you have, for example, a bust of Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius was noted for his courage in securing the Roman borders from the barbarians. And again, this was really an illusion to Charles V, who guarded the borders of the Habsburg Empire against the Turks. And this choice of themes or scenes from history and mythology incorporating allegory uh, with rich decoration is one of the characteristics of the late Renaissance. Uh, and these rooms are considered some of the most valuable late Renaissance rooms in the Czech lands. In fact, no other rooms quite like this imperial room survives uh, in Central Europe. Today, the designer is thought to be the man you see on the left, Jacopo de Strada, who was an architect, artist, antiquarian and connoisseur uh, at the court of Rudolf II. And we know that he stayed for a few nights at Butchevitsa in the 1580s. Um, <clears throat> so he was artistic advisor to Rudolf II. Uh, Rudolf II's reign uh, coincided with the beginning of the 17th century and the first half of the 17th century was not a period that was favourable to building or gardening because by the early 1600s in the reign of Rudolf there was growing tension developing between the old Protestant Czech nobility who were largely Protestant and the Roman Catholic Habsburg families who were coming into the country. And these tensions between the two finally erupted in the Battle of the White Mountain, just outside Prague in 1621, when the Protestant army was destroyed and the Protestant nobility who refused to take the Roman Catholic faith were sent into exile and their estates confiscated. And this was really the first of the great brain drains that the Czech lands have suffered um, because this was a time when, for example, Comenius uh, left the country and came over briefly to England before going to Sweden. This was when Wenceslas Holler came to the Great Engraver, came to Britain. And this whole situation sparked off the Thirty Years' War between the Protestants and the Catholics when the Czech lands were devastated by foreign troops marching over the land. Over a hundred towns were destroyed, uh, 300 castles, and a quarter of the population was lost. And uh, so obviously this was not a time up to uh, the 1650s that was suitable for building and new building enterprises. But towards the end of the 17th century, as the country began to recover, so building began again. And one of the earliest great builders and patrons was a bishop, Bishop Karl von Liechtenstein Kasselkorn, whom you see on the left. He had a passionate interest in architecture, in painting, in music and gardening, and had a notable collection of rare books and an important musical archive, which actually still survives at Cromerich today. On his accession uh, in 1664, Medieval and Renaissance Cromerich was in ruins. The town fortifications, the walls had been destroyed and many of the buildings. Uh, the bishop, who was very energetic, he immediately set about rebuilding the town and creating a great new princely residence for himself here. Uh, employing a leading Italian architect of the day, a man called Tencala, who was at this time working in Vienna for the Habsburg Emperor Leopold. So the first thing he did was to begin creating a brand new um, uh, palace, which originally was fortified, was fortified with a moat surrounding it. The moat has now been filled in. Unfortunately, much of the bishop's interior was destroyed by fire in the 18th century, but one very beautiful series of rooms remains. Um, 
the bishop had a passion for gardening, and this was a sala terrena. This was a series of three rooms, the central room, which you see here, and two rooms, one at each end, which formed fantastic grottos with waterworks, fountains, statues, and so on. And, and the rooms led out onto the garden. These great, there were great doors leading up directly out onto the garden. So it was a summer room, as you would have had in, in Italy, for relaxing and looking out into the garden. But as well as this, the bishop was developing his own garden uh, a little way from the palace, uh, which you see here, both in the engraving and in an aerial shot. Now, this garden is very important. It was begun round about 1665 and is one of the, possibly the earliest Baroque garden to survive in Europe. We know exactly what it looked like because a whole series of engravings were made just shortly after it was created. You can see from the aerial view here on the left that at this time, when this photograph was taken, this whole side of the garden, this part here, um, which is the same as this part over here where my arrow is pointing, was unrestored. Uh, it, ha it hasn't got the water features, which you see up here, hasn't got these little mounts. And this whole area of the garden down here, which corresponds with this area here, was totally um, was, was just grass. But uh, again, in the last 10 years, uh, an incredible amount of work has been done on this garden, which is now part of a, the uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site. These features, the waterworks, the water pools have been, have been uh, recreated. These little mounds, which gave views over the garden, have been built, rebuilt. And uh, this area down here, which um, had a little island um, temple uh, uh, on a bridge in a, in a water feature where you could picnic, this has been recreated. The bishop was also an avid collector of paintings and a great coup was that he actually acquired part of the collection of Charles I, which had been put on sale by Cromwell after Charles's execution. And one of the lovely pictures that remains from this in the, in the castle today, from this period uh, of collecting, is this lovely painting of Charles and Henrietta Maria by Van Dyck, a very uh, tender work which shows, I think, the relationship between the two of them. Uh, other great works he acquired at the time, including included paintings by Giorgione, Tintoretto, Veronese, Correggio, Dura, and Cranach. Not all of these survive in the castle collection, unfortunately, but an important and rather grisly late Titian survives the flaying of Mazaris, which you see on the left here. Now the bishop also founded a library uh, and he was very enlightened because in that he also opened the library to the public, he established a reading room here. The library that you see today, is uh, the books are from his time, or many of them are, but the actual building, the actual library itself uh, is from the 18th century because you may remember that I said much of the interior of the castle was destroyed in a fire. So the library was rebuilt in the 1740s and 50s. Uh, and what, what is characteristic about uh, work in Bohemia and Moravia, many beautiful libraries uh, are created in monasteries and chateaux throughout the country. Uh, there is a superb work in uh, woodwork and wood carving uh, in the Czech lands. So some very beautiful libraries like this survive. You notice there's a uh, great fresco decoration as well. Um, and this was a time when, uh, which is leading on to the next period, the Baroque period, when uh, fresco decoration, great allegorical paintings became extremely fashionable.
The period uh, from the 1680s, 1690s up to the 1750s is a great period for the arts in Bohemia and Moravia. And the, the buildings that were erected at this time are really the country's great contribution to Western European Baroque, because this was a time at the end of the 17th century and throughout the first half of the, of the 18th century, when the great Austrian and German aristocratic families established themselves in Bohemia and Moravia as great landowners and began to build. And the Roman Catholic Church as well was a great patron, anxious to demonstrate its power and control after the troubles of the Reformation. So there was a huge uh, palace and church building program. And the style in which these um, palaces and churches were built is known as Baroque. It's a style that developed after about 1600 in Italy and then was imported to the Czech lands by Italian, German and Austrian architects and artists. And the characteristics of Baroque are grandeur, mass and monumentality. Uh, buildings are built on a huge scale and, they, and you see the love of the dome. Uh, the dome, of course, is associated with three-dimensional mass and monumentality. Uh, this is, uh, the bottom picture is Yara Maritza, a huge country house that was built in this period. And in contrast to the relatively quiet buildings of the Renaissance, the Baroque liked to inject a building with movement. And so, for example, here in the top picture of Slavkov, you've got the, <coughs> the wings um, curved, in this sort of elliptical curve, and then the eye is drawn down to this great climax in the centre with the great convex domed saloon. In many of these uh, great Baroque schemes, the, art, the arts fuse. You have architecture, painting and sculpture so that you can barely tell where one begins and another ends. This is a fantastic frescoed room where you can see when it's well executed, are these figures actually sculpture in the niches or are they in fact painted? Very often they're so well painted, they look like three dimensional figures. Of course, this Baroque style was ideally suited to the pretensions of the aristocracy, who wanted grand houses with rich decoration as a sign of their wealth and status, because many of them held high imperial <coughs> high office at the imperial court in Vienna. So they called in architects and artists from Austria and Italy to create palaces on the grandest scale. Uh, such a person was this Dominic Aldrey Konitz of Slavkov. He was one of many young noblemen who began to build, rebuild his ancestral seat on a monumental scale that would reflect his prestige and social status, because he had a very important career at the, um, uh, at the court, eventually becoming vice chancellor at the imperial court in Vienna. And as a young man, he'd done a grand tour. He visited Italy, France, Switzerland, Germany. He even came to England to the court of Charles II. And he very much admired the French court culture of Louis IV at Versailles. Um, here are two plans for his new palace. The first plan shows that he was going to plan it as a rather like in the Renaissance, a courtyard house. And then that plan was discarded. And instead he built uh, it as, I'm going to show you in a second, um, this great house with the curving, uh, a curving wings here, which provided the stables. And then the eye led down with these curving wings to the great dome saloon at the center, such as you saw in the slide I showed a minute ago. Uh, so it's on the grandest scale, a vast house, and in the interior you have wonderful decoration, very high quality uh, painting and stucco work carried out by Italians. Another great house built at this period was Ranoff, one of the most dramatic examples of Baroque architecture. Here the great Viennese architect Fischer von Erlach 
executed one of his finest works in 1698, when he converted a medieval fortress into a Baroque palace for Count Althan, who was again an ambitious and very wealthy imperial privy councillor. Uh, as you can see, the building occupies a superb position poised above the sheer cliffs that rise high above the river, the valley of the River Dee. And what uh, Fischer von Erlach did, he um, built on the site of the medieval castle, uh, this spectacular oval hall, which juts out over the cliff. Uh, and it's this that gives the castle such an exciting profile. Um, and the Baroque loved the oval fall because the oval is suggestive of movement. Here he built inside the oval that was this ancestor's hall. It was fashionable at this time to display the splendor of one's family ancestry in a hall of ancestors. So here around the walls, you have a display of over life-size ancestors going back into the hoary mists of time. Uh, very often they would make up ancestors going back to the medieval period to try and give the impression that their lineage was much older than it actually was. And the ceiling is painted with a huge apotheosis of the Althan fa family. Here in the center, you have Apollo on his chariot, uh, representing this, the, uh, the, the genius of the family, surrounded by these winged figures who are all bearing the symbols, the standards of the Althan family. And notice actually the trompe l'oeil, which is so characteristic of the Baroque. It looks as if this is a real curtain, uh, as it were, descending down into the space of the room. And actually, of course, it's all just painted. Just one other example where Fischer van Erlach was also involved, Valtizzi, a great uh, house for the uh, Liechtenstein family. Again, you have a house led up to by wings. Uh, you can just see one on the right, which incorporate uh, the stables and office buildings. And inside you have much of its original decoration, these lovely panelled rooms uh, picked out in gilding. And part of the famous picture collection, which ran into three or four rooms, you notice incidentally that some of the spaces are actually empty. The reason for this was that these were obviously small paintings, which the Liechtenstein family quickly took uh, when they realized the Russians were coming near at the end of the war. They had to escape. They loaded up a train with the most valuable things that they could take, including these little paintings, to escape quickly out of the country. Now we come to the middle of the 18th century when the flamboyance of the Baroque and these huge allegorical schemes go out of fashion in favor of a much lighter form of decoration brought in from France called Rococo. <coughs> Walls tend to be painted white now and picked out in pastel colors. Uh, or there is a fashion for uh, light-hearted pastoral scenes, such as you see on the left, such as you would find, for example, in the paintings of Fragonard or Watteau, or little pastoral scenes, or scenes uh, showing the countryside, because part of the Rococo was an interest in nature. <clears throat> One of the most beautiful uh, of all Rococo rooms to survive in the Czech lands is this great ceremonial hall at Kromerich, which was created in the 1760s. <coughs> and it shows the fashion for the white walls just picked out in gilding. And motifs such as uh, gardening implements, because again, the world of nature, music, leaves and flowers. And one of the most amazing rooms is this um, palm tree room at Nebulovi, 
when I first saw this room, the entire ceiling was in thousands of pieces <coughs> laid out on, on cloths in an adjacent room. And the whole thing has been put together very cleverly recently. There was a delight in China, in exotic lands. And here is a lovely China cabinet or Chinese cabinet uh, with lacquer cabinets uh, and paintings in chinoiserie paintings in the Chinese style where the friends contributed uh, funds for the rest restoration of the wallpaper, which was in a fairly bad state. <coughs> Music and the theater played a very important part in the life of the aristocracy. The families would often, themselves would often act in plays or perform in little operas. And a number of country house theatres still survive <coughs> in the Czech Republic with their original stage sets and their original uh, costumes and props. One of the most famous, or the most famous to survive, and one of the uh, best in Europe, is the lovely theatre of 1760s in the chateau of Chesky Krumlov. And many of its original sets survive, uh, and uh, uh, the, the theatre machinery, for example, under the stage, you've got this machinery for creating the sound of thunder. You've got the clouds that descend into the, into the stage, into the performance. And you've got many, many survivals of, of, of costumes and props. Uh, very close to the theatre, in the same chateau, there's this extraordinary masked room. The walls of this entire room are painted with uh, figures at a masked ball. It's very fashionable in the 18th century to have masked balls. And here all the characters from a masked ball are portrayed <clears throat> uh, in, a painting, in paintings by uh, an Austrian artist in the 1740s. Now, this sort of um, uh, frivolity didn't have a long life, though, uh, and the Rococo style went out of fashion in the 1770s and 1780s. By then, it was regarded as a frivolous style. Throughout Europe, there was a reaction to it, to what is known as the neoclassical style, which is really a new way of looking at classical architecture. Externally, the style is uh, austere and severe, with little in the way of sculpture and uh, <coughs> sculptural enrichment or ornament, but in internally some very beautiful, chaste, neoclassical interiors were created. Um, this is uh, the staircase at Boscovitsa, I think one of the most beautiful classical staircases in the Czech lands. And then on the right, the, the library from Kachina. This is actually a circular room designed in the shape of the Pantheon in Rome. And you come in from a rather dark vestibule and then suddenly you're in this great circular room filled with light from the, do <coughs> the dome, the lit dome above you. At the same time as the, as the neoclassical movement, and the Romantic movement was developing with its interest in nature and the imagination. And the Romantic movement can first really be seen in the growing taste for the naturalistic landscape, which was <clears throat> a reaction against what was felt to be the artificiality of the formal Baroque garden with its straight avenues and straight alleys. Um, and here uh, at Kromirich, where you, <clears throat> a new landscape garden was created, not where the bishop had his uh, uh, garden I showed you earlier on, but in a site much closer to the palace where the old Baroque garden had been, where a Baroque garden had originally been created. And there a great landscape park was created. It is in the creation of the landscape park that the influence of England was particularly strong in the Czech lands. Our landscape movement had of course begun earlier with seven, in the 1750s and even before with, uh, with Capability Brown and his successors. And here at uh, Lenitsa, uh, 
the man you see on the left-hand side in the screen, Alloy of Liechtenstein, when he <coughs> uh, 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 inherited the title uh, in the early 1800s, he was fascinated by landscape. Originally, there had been a Baroque, a great Baroque garden here with huge avenues and alleys. Uh, he sent his gardener for four years to England to find out what was happening here in, in, in Britain. And he revolutionized the landscape at Lednitsa and Veltitsa. Lednitsa was the summer house of the Liechtenstein family, and Veltitsa, which I showed you earlier on, was their winter house. Of course, they already had a palace in Vienna um, <clears throat> and another one in Prague. But um, this great landscape park united, uh, uh, takes over an area of about six kilometers, square kilometers, and unites both palaces. And you can see the great lake, the planting of the trees, and all around the, this huge area of park were many little classical pavilions, places where, for example, in this triumphal arch, upstairs at the top, which has been recently restored, there was a room where you could stop uh, <clears throat> during a hunting expedition and have refreshments. All these uh, follies are joined by a system of vistas so that from one you can see another. And they also include this little uh, hunting lodge or hunting pavilion you see on your bottom, the bottom right, which was built in the shape, as you can see, of a ruin. Now, this is an interesting building in architectural history because it was the first building in the sort of Gothic Revival style in the Czech lands. Um, <clears throat> the Gothic Revival had, of course, started in England much earlier, right back in the 1720s and 1730s, but it became extremely fashionable in the Czech lands uh, in the early 19th century. And certainly by the 1840s and 1850s, uh, everywhere houses were being built in a Gothic Revival style. Here again, the influence of England was paramount. The aristocracy would often, if, even if they didn't visit England, they would have all the latest pattern books from England. One can see these in their libraries today. Uh, in the case of Jan Schwarzenberg, who built uh, Hluboka, he actually made two visits to England. He came over to England uh, for the time, for the period of Queen Victoria's coronation, when he brought his wife. He'd already been there in England before that. He went to visit many of the new Gothic revival houses that had been going up. And at Windsor Castle, he was so impressed that he wanted to build a house that would remind him of Windsor. So here he built Truboka in Bohemia. Uh, another great house was built, was Lenitsa, built by the Liechtensteins, who were related by marriage to the Schwarzenbergs. And the interiors of these buildings are often of the highest quality, with wonderful woodwork and, um, uh, 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 and, and other decoration, furniture supplied to these uh, buildings. And in fact, it's amazing that despite all the troubles of the war and the, com and the communist years, some amazing Gothic revival interiors survived in the Czech lands, some complete with their original furnishings, forming a remarkable time capsule. And that exists at both Lenitsa, but particularly Hluboka. And at Bitov here, Externally, it is a medieval castle, but internally it has some of these ravishing Gothic revival interiors where you've got this Gothic trope decoration, all the arcades, the, tref the arcading, the Gothic pinnacles and so on are painted in this illusionistic manner. One of the last uh, Gothic revival castles to build, be built was Bozov. Uh, its recreation of the medieval world as late as the late 19th century. The castle was the brainchild of the Habsburg Archduke Eugene of Austria, Grand Master of the Order of Teutonic Knights. And Busov was intended to be 
a prestigious seat for the order, and it would symbolize its glorious past, because of course the Teutonic Knights go right back to the medieval period. And so the entire interior was decorated in medieval style, with medieval style far, fireplaces, uh, uh, ceilings, and, and furniture in a sort of Gothic revival style. Uh, the castle wasn't finished until 1912, and then, of course, the First World War broke out. And at the end of the war, there was, of course, a new world order. The Habsburg Empire had been destroyed, and out of its ashes, many new independent countries had arisen. And this is when the first uh, Republic of Czechoslovakia was created. And Czechoslovakia became one of the most progressive countries architecturally between the wars and in other ways as well. Um, and one of the most interesting houses built during the years of the First Republic is the Villa Tugendhat of Brno, built by the internationally known, known architect Mies van der Rohe for a wealthy Jewish couple, Fritz and Greta Tugendhat. And this has been sensationally restored after years of neglect. But when you think that Bozov <coughs> was finished in 1912 and Villa Tugendhat was begun in 1930, just 28 years separate them, but it's, it's as if they were centuries apart. The Tugendhats could only enjoy their home for about eight years because in 1938 they had to flee the country to escape the Nazis. Because in 1938 Hitler invaded and seized all the borderlands of Czechoslovakia and then occupied the rest of the country. So the area in black uh, in this map is the Sudetenland, the borderlands, which were the first to be seized before the rest of the country. And the next 50 years were a tragic period, both for the Czech people and for the great houses. Many houses suffered through the war, through German or Russian occupation, but worse was to come because in 1948 the communists came to power in a coup and confiscated all the properties of the so-called parasite classes. Uh, most of the nobility then fled into exile. Uh, those who remained had an appalling time, suffering imprisonment and persecution. Many were sent to work in the notorious uranium mines. And the communists were then left with literally thousands of houses which they couldn't possibly maintain. About a hundred were turned into country house museums. Others were turned into institutions like orphanages, barracks, agricultural buildings, or simply left to disintegrate. Their furniture and furnishings, the family archives and, and memorabilia were often scattered, sold or stolen during those first chaotic years. Then came the Velvet Revolution in 1989, when Parliament passed an Act of Restitution in 1991, restituting all confiscated private property back to their former Czech owners or their heirs. A property wasn't returned to Germans. Uh, German property had already been confiscated in 1945 after the war in the decrees of President Benesch. So in the 1990s, you had a situation which would have been unbelievable a few years earlier of the old Czech nobility coming back from all over the world from areas where they had to work initially very humbly as cleaners, postmen, salesmen, anything that they could do at that time of, of unemployment in the early 1950s. They came back, many of them, to reclaim their houses. Some have returned to find wrecks and have had to take, undertake the massive task of restoration. And one example that I always like to use is that really of Count Joseph Kinski and, and his Empire House at Kostelec. Um, <clears throat> Count Kinski had, had several, had all his siblings left the country uh, at the time of the communist coup. Uh, he stayed behind, he was the only one to stay behind, to look after his elderly parents. But he was imprisoned, he was put in the, um, in the uranium mines, in fact, he had a terrible, ter he was terribly persecuted, and eventually <clears throat> when he 
was allowed out. He was not allowed to have a professional job. He just had to work as a, as a painter, a house painter. Uh, he got his property back, which had been used as a pig breeding centre during the communist times. It had been deliberately degraded. Uh, he managed to get a 25% grant uh, from the government to towards the restoration. And in his 80s, he took out a brick building, a mortgage on a brick building business and started restoration work. Uh, you can see the situation of the house as it was when he took over in the early 1990s. He died, he was determined that the Kinsky house, he was very proud of his Kinsky forebears, who had of course been a great name in Czech history. Um, <clears throat> he, he wanted the house to be, to get back its old glory. He died before it was completed, but it has been wonderfully completed uh, and f finished by his sons. And in fact, all the furniture survived in store in very bad state, but it's been survived, been restored and has been returned to the house. But it's not just the old aristocracy who, restore, who are restoring their houses. Since the 1990s, the state has made great efforts to restore houses that have been inaccessible for years and open them to the public. Um, for example, one of the most important is um, Kinschwart, the former home of the Austrian Chancellor Metternich, or at least one of his homes, his summer house. Uh, in the early 1990s, when I first saw it, it looked like uh, the picture on the top left. Um, and now it looks like the picture at the bottom right. And what so impressed me when I was uh, traveling around the country in the 1990s is that buildings like this, which were in such an appalling state, buildings like this, which in England we would have despaired of and as beyond hope uh, uh, and would have demolished, these were being bravely taken on in the Czech Republic and a fantastic success has been made of this house. Even Metternich's library has been uh, restored and put back in the building. And as more houses are restored and reopened to the public, so the way of presenting these houses has completely changed. Previously, all mention of the family and family history had been taboo because of course the families with their aristocratic pedigree were of course tainted. They were regarded as pariahs. In one house, for example, the portraits of the family had been replaced with paintings of dogs. But now the family story has, is being told in many, many houses. Uh, curators have gone to great efforts to try and find where they survive. Old suitcases of documents, photographs, old menus, invitations and so on, and even have tried to recreate some of the rooms as they would have looked uh, following old photographs. So the family is now much more connected uh, with, the, <clears throat> with the life of the family is much more connected with the house than it was previously. We have been looking uh, at this talk in grand houses, but before I end, I just want to say there are thousands of more humble buildings across the Czech lands, which form a very important part of the landscape. And many of them, like the one you see here in the bottom left, are in, still in a dire state. This is Chechevitsa, a small Baroque house, a small Baroque manor house or farmstead, which used to belong to the wealthy Troutman Stork family, who would stop over here whilst visiting their estates in the area. Um, and from 19... 55, it had been used as a dormitory for agricultural workers in the nearby state farm and then abandoned and just used as a garage. Uh, by 1990, all the roofs were in absolute perilous condition and a fire had completely destroyed this, uh, the roof of this wing here on the left. But the villagers have shown great enterprise in trying to find a community use for this abandoned building. Uh, they got a grant to repair the roof, as you can see in the bottom photograph, 
And just working on this building um, took an enormous amount of time. Uh, here in this photograph at the bottom, the gentleman in the centre, he single-handed uh, cleared out the massive amount of debris that was in the beautiful Baroque granary. Uh, you can see the interior now with all the debris removed, and so it will form an exhibition space uh, to be used uh, within the community. Now, since the country joined the EU, it, um, more money has been forthcoming with EU and other grants, but these tend to focus on the grander properties. To raise funds for buildings like this is much more difficult. There's very little money and progress is slow, so that one year you might have a few windows repaired, as here, uh, another year a gateway, and so on. It's actually taken 30 years to achieve what you can see on the screen today at Chechevitsa. But on my many travels through the country in the 1990s and early 2000s, I saw so many similar examples of this um, <clears throat> uh, dedication that I was full of admiration for the courage and determination of the Czech people to recover their heritage despite all the odds. And it was this admiration and concern that led me and Ian Kenaway of the National Trust, who felt the same, to found the Friends of Czech Heritage in 2007 as a small charity to support their endeavours. And to date, under our chairman, Peter Jameson, we've helped fund over 40 different projects and have had many voluntary working parties and are hugely grateful for the support that many of you here tonight have given us, and without which all that we have done would not have been possible. So we've been involved in many small projects like Chechevitsa, but one of our greatest successes, I think, has been helping to awaken the huge Sleeping Beauty house of Juha Chitsa. Uh, as Peter said when I, in his introduction, when I first discovered Juha Chitsa in about 1994, it was boarded up and due for demolition as a huge white elephant. You can see from the photos what a vast house it is. Um, but further investigation, it had been very badly used. It had been used as a, as a, a reformatory uh, during communist times for women. It had also been used as a barracks by, for the border guards and it had been terribly abused. But further investigation revealed it to be a fascinating house in many periods. There were many Renaissance features, there was Baroque work with wonderful stucco work. There was neoclassical wall paintings, a beautiful neoclassical ballroom, uh, and so on. And a lot of work of high quality, but in this lamentable condition. Bit by bit, with very limited resources, restoration has taken place very slowly over the last 25 years. And the friends have been involved throughout this period. But in 2018, there was a breakthrough when the quality and potential of the house was recognized by the EU. And New Hachitsa has received a huge grant of over three and a half million pounds, one of just five houses in the Czech lands to receive such a grant. And the work will be completed this year in 2021. And we felt it was a kind of vindication of all our efforts. Uh, the money won't be enough to restore the whole huge house, but it will be a massive help enabling concerts and other fundraising activities to take place. Mm. Of course, in conclusion, it will take many more years to repair the destruction of 50 years in the, in the country as a whole. But the wonderful thing is that the determination and courage to restore the damage of the past are there. And every year new delights are revealed and thus the incredible diversity and richness of the country's architectural heritage will be revealed to the visitor who looks not only at Prague, but at the richesse which lies awaiting him to discover in the countryside beyond. Thank you very much. Barbara, I hope you. I hope everybody can hear me now. Um, thank you very yes, much indeed. That was a 
tour de force really was. Uh, I, I knew what I, I knew what to expect, and and we got it. That was absolutely marvellous. Um, I'm aware that it's now twenty past seven, um, and I hesitate to ask for questions. Um, but I would first of all say thank you very very much, and and secondly that this talk has been recorded, so it will be available um, on our website if you want to. Uh, delve into it.